Hello and welcome to Shim on Ops. So today we have a very special guest, Or Wise. Hi, Or. Hi, great. And we got. It's great to have you. So today we're going to have a session about uh, permissions as a service, which is a very interesting piece of utility. I see it uh, uh, very much in the tension points between engineering and DevOps. So we're going to talk about the problem space, the different solutions that exist, and Or is going to tell us a little bit more about how they solve this problem with Permit. And then, of course, we're going to have a hands-on hardcore demo showing code. So, Or, um, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. So, my name is Or Weiss. Uh, as you've uh, kind of deduced from between the lines, I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Permit.io, which is a permissions as a service solution. My background uh, starts as an intelligence core officer in the IDF. Uh, there I was also a programmer, the uh, team lead, project manager, yada, yada, yada. I then worked in a startup that built containers before containers were a thing, but with a terrible go-to-market. But with cool other companies coming out of that startup, uh, Logs.io, Solo.io, now Permit.io. I was a VP of R&D in a cybersecurity company. And I founded another uh, dev tool startup called Rookout, which is a production debugging solution. During my time at Rookout, I ended up rebuilding the access control to our product five times when the company wasn't even <laughs> three years old. And uh, that really taught me on the pain point that we're solving today with Permit.io. Yeah, makes sense. I guess uh, a lot of the audience have, uh, you know, started by building something. Uh, you start with something that has no permission, no controls, no anything. Mm -hmm. And then you go like, okay, let's make sure that we can actually use a login. So then you start with authorization. Okay. Sorry, authentication. Right. Authentication, yeah. which is very widely used with the Auth0. I know a lot of people do it. There are some people who use and other solutions like Frontag and so on. Mm -hmm. and, but then as we go into the permission space, so the area is not to authenticate that OR is OR. The area is to understand what OR can do. Right. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, the problem space and, and how do you differentiate between the two? Yeah, for sure. So I think you differentiated well between authentication and authorization. And by the way, there's also identity management at the top. So you have things like Okta, where your end customers, the organization, will be managing their identities that they have. Those will then be verified by authentication as you move into the vendor side, into the product. Then you'll mm -hmm. probably, you'll usually have a JSON web token, a cryptographically signed document that verifies the identity of the user and maybe has additional claims about them. And then you arrive at the app itself And now the app needs to decide, according to the identity, according to the JSON web token, what are you actually allowed to do? Are you allowed to delete this file? Are you allowed to send an email? Are you allowed to interact with another user? Are you allowed to use the paid feature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And permission, authorization or permissions, I really like to say, is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you always think that you're done with it, and then there's a new requirement coming in either from your customers or from your security and compliance, like if you're doing SAC2 or ISO, those will, or GDPR even, they like 90 to 80% of them is uh, access control requirements in, in actual uh, app stands. And, um, and you constantly need to develop more features and more um, uh, policy models. And maybe the policy models is something that is worth kind of Uh, delaying on. So everyone starts with a very simple model that I like to call admin, not admin. I'm the developer. Yeah, this is what I want to say. Like you always start with like viewer, non-viewer, like admin, non-admin. This is like the most basic thing. Mm -hmm. And let's build on that. Correct. And so as with admin, not admin, you're basically saying I'm the developer. I'll have the permissions to change things and everyone else. Uh, good luck. You can do with the rest of the limited permissions I'll give you. But then real users start to use the app. Other stakeholders, product managers, security compliance come in and say, oh, we need different permissions for ourselves as well. And then you go, okay, fine. So now we'll do admin, not admin, and super admin. I'll be the super admin. I'll give the product manager, maybe security, they'll be an admin. And then everyone else is just, uh, just a regular user. 
Uh, but obviously there, it doesn't end there. Almost everyone ends up at either access control lists or RBAC. RBAC is really the bread and butter of the uh, permission. So RBAC is role-based access control. Correct. And that So I'm saying users from this group and, and those types of users can do certain actions. So users that I've assigned to them a specific role in a specific context, either a tenant, the entire application, a group within the product, they will get their permissions according to the role that they have. So you take the identity, you translate that into a role, and then according to the role, you decide what they're allowed to do or not as the role is assigned to different things. Um, and that's the most common uh, permission model that people think about. It has become very uh, widespread because it's A, simple to think about, and B, it has become very common in enterprise applications. So customers end up asking for it just because they know it from other applications. So it's just a matter of time when you're building an application catering to organizations that they'll ask for RBAC. But it, even, it doesn't even end there. Because from there, you're moving to RBAC plus something, like RBAC plus ownership. Now, it's just not enough just to be uh, an editor, for example. You need to be an editor and specifically be an editor on a specific file that you own. Uh, okay, so I have a role and then I have, an, uh, I have a certain entity that I'm given access to. So instead of like all those users can do whatever they want, it's like those type of roles can do something on a specific object. Mm -hmm. And so you have either a relationship or an attribute that gives you additional access to things. And this is where you start to move from RBAC into ABAC, attribute-based access control. Attribute-based access control is basically a fancy name to say that I have data points on the various uh, entities and objects that I have. I have uh, attributes about my user. For example, that, those can come as claims in the JSON web token. For example, you, you're a citizen of the United States or France or Israel. That's an attribute about you that we might decide to use as part of the mm -hmm. permissions. Or for example, if you're trying to access a server that is located in Europe, but you're based in the US, maybe we shouldn't allow that because of GDPR or something like that. Yep. Um, so that that's a back and time geolocation quotas billing status those are classic things that are uh, only relevant in a back you can't do them with a role just think for example about a, a simple policy like only users that have paid for a feature can use it so you need that bit of information about billing to be available in the authorization system and you need to reason about it. And you can't reason about it as a role because you have like, now we have a paying user role. That's kind of weird. So that's something else that you need to combine with the roles. And that's where ABAP would come in. And there's all, and it doesn't end there either. There's ReBAP, relationship-based <laughs> access control. <laughs> and relationship-based access control is basically when you have hierarchies and relationships. For example, you want to say, you can edit a file if you have permissions to access that file or if you have permissions to access the folder that contains that file or the folder that contains that folder, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the most important thing to understand is that these policy models are constantly evolving as your product is evolving. And there isn't like one pure policy model. No one does pure RBAC. No one does pure ABAC. No one does pure REBAC. Um, you always have some amalgam of these different models to meet the snowflake scenario that is your unique application. In the end of the day, you're not building some generic product. You're building a real product that people want to use. And so it will have unique usage scenarios that you need to address. Um, okay. So, so we start from the very basic admin, non-admin. Then we move to RBAC where we have different roles that they allow people to do things. Mm -hmm. Then we add on the roles plus certain uh, attributes, or objects, you might say. Then we have attribute-based control. Um, so it seems to me that this is something that I would not want to build by myself. Well, uh, it doesn't seem to have any unique, um, you know, undifferentiated value for my whatever Uber app or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how does the, the landscape of solution looks like today. So 
I'm like every company obviously needs those different types and the problem is is very prominent so so what does you know companies do today so first and foremost up until now yeah everyone have, have been building this themselves I literally literally built this thousands of times throughout the <laughs> and I'll add that at no point did I want to I just built it because I didn't have any alternative um, but now as authentication has matured, Uh, like if you go seven years, 10 years ago, people would also be building authentication on their own. And if you talk to them, yeah. they'll be like, what? I'll trust a third party solution to build this critical part of my system. And people would go, no way. But obviously the tables have turned. And now people say, what? Am I crazy to build this sensitive part on my own? It's really dangerous and hard to do. So Or credit cards, you know, people used to process credit cards. Now no one's, no one's like, I'm not going to touch a credit card. <laughs> no way. To continue to build more complex applications, we need to be able to delegate these generic yet complex scenarios to other solutions so we can focus on our core features. And I think that's... Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so how does this, so our audience, they're advanced, they're like, people who understand buy versus build. So how does the landscape look today? So let's say I'm Shimon, I'm building my next unicorn app, and now I have a thousand unicorns being sold. Now, how can I go about that if I want a author uh, authorization solution? So you can start, first of all, with open source. Um, so you have solutions like OPA, Open Policy Agent, and uh, more recently, uh, Cedar from AWS. Uh, these are policy as code languages. They enable you to create a microservice for authorization, basically a service that you can query with authorization queries and receive authorization decisions. You can basically ask it, can this user perform this action on this resource? And you write policies code in a decoupled fashion and you can query it uh, uh, there. Uh, part so wait, 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 let's pause. Okay. So, so the first solution is I have a microservice and then all of my other services They take the attributes of a request. They say, Shimon wants to edit this unicorn at this point of time on this server. They send it to this microservice and the microservice is the brains in a way. Yeah. It evaluates all the attributes and it basically tells you, can you allow the user to do it or not? Correct. Or maybe filter the data that you, you want to present or maybe filter even the query before you pass it to the database. Change the SQL, for example. That's also something that uh, these uh, engines can do. Um, the challenge with these engines, though, is how you manage them at scale and how you load them with the policy and data that you need. Uh, this is where another open source project comes in. Uh, and full disclaimer, I'm one of the authors of this project. It's called OPAL, Open Policy Administration Layer, and it works for multiple engines like OPA and Cedar. It enables you to track policies directly from Git and load data from whatever you need into the policy engine. So let's say you want something like, a, like that policy I mentioned before. Only users that have paid for a feature can use it. That bit of information of who paid for something, that doesn't exist anywhere. That exists in your billing service. But you need to make that information available as soon as possible in the authorization microservice. So this is something that Opal would do for you. It would track the billing service. And when an update happens mm -hmm. in an event-driven fashion, it will update the tens, hundreds, or even thousands, or even more uh, microservices for authorization that you have in your app. Um, so, and then that, then what you'll you do, you'll uh, deploy Opal, you'll deploy a Git repository where you manage your uh, code, and you'll set up data connections to feed into the authorization there. The challenge there is how you manage all of this, because You have open source components and they're great, um, but it can still be a lot of work both to manage this at scale and to author these policies. Uh, and this is where... So it's just code. You just you write like regular code. You need to make sure it's being distributed to all of your OPA servers. So Opal can help you with that, but you still, you're like, you gotta wake up at four in the morning if there's a problem with this OPA. Yeah. And also writing Rego code, Rego is a very powerful language And Cedar, they're very powerful languages, but they're not like run of your, run of the mill languages. <laughs> It's not like <laughs> not the not the best, not not the easiest. Yeah, they're 
they're kind of more like logical programming languages. They're functional, but lo logical programming languages. Uh, Rego specifically is a derivative of Prolog and Datalog. And they're, they have a, quite a bit of a steep learning curve. Uh, so now the question is, how do you enable uh, the various people on your team, both developers and non-technical people, to be able to author policies? Um, and Okay. So, so before we move into uh, your specific solution and a demo, so I understand there's like the buy versus build, they're open source solutions. Are there other companies, are there vendors? Like, I don't know, does the cloud vendors offer something around that? Yeah. So first, maybe let's start with what people do with authentication for authorization, then talk about uh, what the cloud vendors do and, and, and other companies that uh, exist in the space. So... Uh, first of all, what, what a lot of people do, and I actually don't recommend, it's kind of an anti-pattern, is to either use uh, the authentication itself um, and uh, for authorization. So what you do is you ch they try to load the policies or the data for the policies directly into the JSON web token. I've seen companies for example, mm -hmm. load the actual routes, the HTTP routes that the user is allowed to query in the application which sounds cool at the beginning when you do that, uh, but then when you need to update their permissions or when you need to add more routes to the system, the JSON web token that you're sending for every request starts to bloat, your performance starts to die down and, and everyone's sad. So I, I know it might be tempting, but please don't use JOTs for authorization. They're meant for uh, authentication and informing the authorization system. Um, another thing that I see people do is try to use the cloud access control systems, like the AWS IAM. So mm -hmm. AWS IAM is a very powerful system that can uh, have very granular access control to infrastructure components in the cloud. So there what I see people do is they, they couple the, per, the application level permissions to a comp infrastructure component, like a S3 bucket. So they say, oh, if you can access the S3 bucket, then you can read the file, for example. What? And that's, a, that's, as you can already tell, that's a very bad idea because what happens when you want to move to a different data storage service or you want to use a different cloud or you run some of these things locally, um, everything starts to break down. So also it's something that seems very cool at the beginning. Oh, I already have a permission mechanisms here. I'll just shove a little more on top of it but it ends up uh, being a very uh, painful and sets of error. Okay. So, okay. so let's, let's dive deeper into what does your specific solution provide? Why is it special? And I want to see them. We didn't cover uh, our vendors and what the cloud vendors do. So AWS, they've just, for example, they just announced uh, Cedar, which I've mentioned before, this open source language, and they have an upcoming service called Amazon Verified Permissions. Uh, which basically acts as that microservice for authorization within your system. By the way, it also works with Opal. You can use Opal to load uh, policies into it. Um, but uh, it basically only gives you that uh, policy management and policy engine language. Uh, you don't have all the interfaces on top. Um, and you have other vendors uh, that are basically like us, but they don't provide interfaces like we do and maybe that's a good point to focus on what we do with permit um yeah so with permit we really provide end-to-end -end access control uh our real understanding is that as a developer you don't care about this crap you want to focus on building your actual app so yeah. we're not just giving you a policy engine and just uh opal to manage it we're giving you the full inter interfaces that you need we need giving you interfaces that you can give to you other stakeholders, to your product manager, security compliance, and even your end customers with something that we call permit elements, which are ready to be embedded experiences. I'll mention a few experiences and you can see that they sound familiar, like you've seen them a billion times. And every time you saw them, some poor schlep of a developer up till now had to create them from scratch. So user management with the ability to assign roles, API key management, secrets management, audit logs. So you want to see uh, what you did within the system, what your customers did within the system. Allow your customers to see on their own what they did within your system. Yep. Approval flows, invites, emergency access, impersonation, this list just goes on and on. 
And uh, so we provide all of these ready to be embedded. But probably the most important interface that we provide is the policy editor, which is self, it's an interface that I like to say uh, a monkey can use. Or show me, show me. I want to see. I want to see. I want to be the monkey. Show yeah. me. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Um, so here it is. This is so we're now within permit, and this is the policy editor. It actually has m multiple views, uh, but I'll use the card view just for ease of use for now. And you can see here we have a card for each th of the roles that we have within our system. And in the demo app I'll be showing in a second, I'm logged in as an administrator. And you can see that I have defined different uh, resources that I have in my app and different actions or permissions that I can have on those resources. So for example, we have a task here. Let's go now and meet the demo app. So I have a, a to-do list app here and you can see I can add uh, items. So I still see permit, I still see permit. Oh, sorry, so I need to sh share this tab, sorry. Um, yeah, now we see the to-dos. So I can add items to the to-do list. I can check them. I can uncheck them. I can edit them, but I can't delete them. Why? Because I don't have permissions to that. But if I switch back to permit, I can just go here and click on delete and enable that for my role, the administrator role. Click save and immediately that will take effect. So now when I try to delete, I can. And what, mm -hmm. and what that did, it updated the policy in real time, generated new rego code, pushed it into Git and via Opal into the wow. service living inside the app. And immediately it took effect. Um, so, so, wait, wait. So, so from my understanding, it's very interesting because many times in companies, from my experience, the pr people who actually define who has access to what roles are business people or product people. So you can actually provide this dashboard to a non-technical person to decide and, and, and configure the, the types of roles they want. Exactly. And you get it in a, in a this light, no code, uh, low code fashion, but uh, it generates policy as code. So you still get this to be managed in your Git repository. So you, you always have the ability to run tests, uh, benchmarks, code review even, uh, and also add more code okay. on your own. Uh, okay, so but I want to understand how to get started. So let's say you convinced me and my unicorn rentals uh, startup. So how do I get started? How does it work? So it's very simple. We provide you two components that you can embed into your system. One is that microservice for authorization. We can also host it for you. But ideally in production, you'd run that microservice within your system. So you'll have zero latency talking to it. Mm -hmm. and you'll have uh, um, high availability and no security issues because you're managing all, all of this with local data. So that microservice is one key component. And the other one is SDKs. You can embed enforcement points into various points in your software. And the main function that we provide with the SDK is called permit.check. And you pass to it three arguments, identity, action, and resource. You're basically describing mm -hmm. what's happening in the app, and you're asking the microservice for authorization, should I allow this or not? And so you're decoupling policy and code. The policy only lives in that microservice, and your code only describes what's happening. It doesn't need to reason about the policy itself. Uh, and the same goes for ABAC policies. But I see you have something to ask. Yeah. So, and, and do you provide any like uh, permission models like pre-baked because you, you have a lot of experience with different uh, roles and, and stuff. So do you, does permit come with some templates out of the box? So we have those as part of our, uh, as part of our docs. And we also spend a lot of time for customers helping them think about their policy models. But mostly I think the, the great thing about permit is how easy it is to experiment with. If you want to try a new model, both RBAC or ABAC, and I'll just show the ABAC screen quickly. I'm oh, sorry, I closed it by mistake. Um, it's really easy to just play and set more conditions and more attributes and play with stuff and try and fashion this into the uh, layout that fits your application. Um, and usually from what we see, it takes uh, one developer in a mid-sized company, one developer two weeks to move from their homebrew solution to work with us, including modeling everything and 
testing it and deploying this to production. Amazing. So this makes total sense. And now I understand that I really don't want to build yeah. uh, my own uh, authorization service. Um, yeah. A lot of times people don't understand how deep the rabbit hole goes. I'll just show a, a few quick things. So for example, having audit logs that actually explain why the decision was made and having all the state from the policy engine and having it in a way that is quick to filter and search. Um, having uh, ABAC policies, as I said before, having um, permissions for your permissions. So we have projects and environments and you have roles and access control for your access control. Who can change the permissions for the, your app? Who has access to change the access? That's inception. Yeah. Amazing. And, yeah, it, it can get very recursive and very confusing. Um, and as I mentioned before, also permit elements, which are uh, ways to embed to embedded customers. This is amazing. Okay. So before we wrap up, yeah. tell me, how much does it cost? How do I pay? Uh, so it's uh, usage-based pricing. So you pay as you go. First of all, up to 1,000 monthly active users. You don't need to pay at all. Um, we, you, it's free with an extensive quota. Uh, and then you pay according to the amount of users that you have that you check permissions for on a monthly basis. And the idea here is that you, as your app grows and you're catering to more users, you're probably making more success and more money with your application. And, there's a, and it's a win-win scenario that you can uh, also share a little bit with us. And there's a, you just go to permit.io slash pricing. There's a slider. It's really easy to see how much this is going to cost and also a reason how much this is going to cost. Because you say, oh, now I have uh, 50 users. In a year, I'll, I'll hope to have like uh, uh, 2,000 users. So you can know how much it's going to uh, cost you when you get to that point. Amazing. Thank you very much, Or, for educating us about the authorization and permissions. I'll link all of the links to the open sources and your product below. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk with you, Shimon. Uh, have a great time and hope to talk to you next time again.